I doubt you need me to explain to you who the Adams family are, but you may not realise just how far back they date. Created by cartoonist Charles Adams as single panel comics for the New Yorker back in 1938, so kind of crazy to think that they actually predate World War II and had been around for nearly three decades by the time the 60s TV show really brought them to the forefront of pop culture, where they've kind of popped in and out ever since. The first time we see a video game is in 1989, which also happened to be the same year the first Tom and Jerry video game came out, if you happen to see that video of mine. Don't know what it was about 1989 and video game franchise debuts, but whatever. It's surprising to see nothing on any of the older systems at all, not even Atari or even in the arcades. What ends up coming along first is Fester's Quest for the NES. Developed by Sunsoft, who apparently still exist, so they've been keeping quiet over the years. Did you know they did the Japanese localization of House Flipper? Anyway, Fester's Quest is based on the 60s TV show, which I guess means we're playing as Jackie Coogan's Uncle Fester. We do get a cutscene to start to explain what's going on. Aliens have come down and abducted all of the town's residents. Thankfully, Grandmama knew this would happen, so had already cast a spell to protect the Adams family. Why she didn't protect everyone else, I don't know, but Uncle Fester isn't as comfortable being complacent, so he goes and gets his gun. I quite like the music in the intro, it's pretty funky. <laughs> The game itself is a top-down shooter. Explore the town and its sewers while blasting the aliens, which can take many forms, but a lot of the time they're just frogs. The aliens will drop items, such as money, which is actually used as a currency in this game, uh, that's not always the case uh, back in the NES times, though from what I can tell you can only buy hot dogs with the money. They also drop other usable items, such as weapons um, and upgrades for your gun. Get a few upgrades under your belt, plus a turbo controller, and nothing is going to stand in Fester's way. Keys will open doors to houses in the neighbourhood, where you'll find a family member who will happily give you a weapon, like some TNT. What the hell was Pugsley planning to do in somebody else's house with TNT? Some Pugsley things, I suppose. You may also find yourself a noose, just in case things get too tough for Fester. That's a bit dark. Well, to be fair, it is actually in case things get too tough, because like in the TV show, you can use the noose to summon Lurch, and he'll just kill everything on screen. I spend a lot of my time waiting for Fester to plod his way along. You'd think, given the situation, he'd show a little bit more urgency. I think I may have encountered a bug which is making him even slower, too. <laughs> The 3D sections did take me by surprise, I didn't really realise they were part of this game, and they're decently ambitious for an NES title. Not really sure who built these houses though, because they have absolutely no rooms, they're just one giant maze of corridors. You also will take damage by walking into a wall, which, I mean I suppose it's technically accurate, if I ran headfirst at a brick wall it would hurt, but come on really? The boss fights are really difficult when compared to the rest of the game. You get dropped in with no warning, and Fester just isn't nearly as athletic enough to be dodging their attacks. It's like poor old Uncle Fester managed to land in a completely different game. Oh, and there's no password system, no built-in cheats, so you've got to beat this game as is, with one whole life. If you saw the menu screen, you'll notice it does have a continue option, but it's effectively useless. You keep the items, but you start at the very beginning of the game, so gee thanks, it's more like a new game plus. To top it all off, it turns out I actually have it easy. The North American release is especially difficult. The gun's bullets will collide with walls and obstacles, making the gun that I found almost overpowered useless half of the time. The pattern your bullets move mean you have to position yourself perfectly to try and get the shot to hit. Just forget about it once you're in the narrow sewer sections. And for whatever reason, the enemies take forever to kill in the American version as well. The European version that I play was released a good year after the US version, 
So it does look like they made some adjustments just to make the game a little bit less difficult and frustrating. Shame they didn't do the same with the bosses. Bit of an odd start, but I suppose that's not surprising given the source material. I actually think it's a neat enough idea on paper, just the concept of it, but the execution really isn't that great. Not quite as bad as its reputation will have you believe, but do remember I was playing the new and improved European release. Come 1991, we see the Addams Family movie hit the theatres. And, as is the standard at the time, we have video game tie-ins. The first of which is... A Tiger Electronics LCD game. So just to explain to people who weren't really around when LCD games were... I don't know about popular, but everywhere. Well, imagine your cheap old school calculator as a gaming system. Yeah, this managed to find its way onto store shelves just before the actual Adams Family games did. Tiger released a million of these based on every franchise you can possibly imagine, and they all have one thing in common. They suck. I'll give them credit, it still works after all of these years. I'm not sure if that's a good thing though. Once again, we're playing as Festa. This time it's a side-scroller, or at least that's what it most closely resembles. Family members will keep throwing stuff at Festa, who has some keys to unlock doors and light bulbs to throw at enemies. Occasionally, I might manage to kill a bat. The screen is often just a mess of objects that you hardly have any time to identify before you can react. Do I really know what's going on? No, but I can tell that it's a high score based game, and I did manage to get 100 points. I can quite happily declare that I have no intention of ever playing this again. And now we get to the actual video games based on the Adams Family movie. There are 12 versions of this game released across as many systems, and they were all developed by Ocean Software, so that's kind of promising. They had the better reputation when it came to licensed games. Just to make things more complicated though, online sources can't seem to agree on exactly when each version got released. They can agree that it was between 1992 and 1994, so since it looks like the first game that finished development was the Super Nintendo version, the way I'm going to go through it is sort of chronological. I'm going to start with the Nintendo versions. They all seem to get released in 92. Then we're going to follow on with the home computer versions, which seem to be the same year. And then on to the Sega versions, which seem to be 93 or maybe even 94. <laughs> but oh wait, there's always one that has to ruin it. Turns out we do have one 1991 Adams Family movie video game, but this was released for the TurboGrafx CD. I bet you didn't expect that to rear its head in. This is the one game not developed by Ocean. Instead, it's by a developer I've never really heard of, Icom Simulations. The CD technology is primarily used to have some actual voice acting in the game. Yeah, it's not easy being you, Tully Alfred. But that's okay. Could have been worse. Could have been an Adams. It's hard trying to live up to Mother's lofty goals. Um, this is kind of cancelled out by the single, still digitised images that are used as cutscenes. I was going to say it's like a slideshow cutscene, but it's not even that. It's just one single picture. They really couldn't get any more narrative than this? Well, how's this for creativity? You play as Tully. You know the family attorney. Your goal is to take as much of the Adams family treasure as you can find, because you have Gomez's permission to do so. Not really sure what this has to do with the movie, but okay, it's a reason to play, I guess. Thankfully, Tully was well aware that the Adams family would be out to kill him, in jest of course, so he came prepared with his umbrella gun. So look, it's a sloppy to control, stiff platformer that drops you right in the deep end on the very first screen with all these enemies out to get you, platforms with pits to avoid, and just to top things off, Gomez hitting golf balls at you from a distance. It doesn't get much better when you get past this area, 
As then you've got the spider and bat infested dwelling of Uncle Fester to contend with. Fester takes forever to beat and the bats are a serious pain. Once you kind of get into the groove it's not too bad but yeah it's pretty tough for the very first part of the game. A lot of people I imagine don't even make it to the main area of the game which is the Adams Family House which acts kind of like a main hub for the rest of the game. From now on you'll collect coloured keys to go through the doors that match the colours. Then you face enemies and solve puzzles to gain more keys to open more doors. This is one of those platformers where you have to treat every encounter like a puzzle to solve. Though usually once you've got it down it becomes a bit of a tedious game of repetition. There's two floors to the house though Tully isn't capable of walking upstairs so you're gonna have to jump up them. Some rooms contain some treasure, some contain a family member who primarily act as a boss fight and around half of them are whatever the hell is going on in here. Seriously, this room repeats itself multiple times over and I can't figure out what the purpose is. These here aren't even enemies, there's just nothing to do. All in all, it's pretty bizarre. I kinda like the idea of exploring the mansion, but I'm not sure this is really doing it for me. For my first Turbo Graphics CD experience, I'm really just quite confused. Now let's get back on track. We're on to the Ocean Software games, starting with the Super Nintendo. This is probably the one most people are going to remember. It doesn't really give you much in terms of story, but based on what I've heard about the development of the game, they weren't really given much to work with, so they just figured, to hell with it. The Adams family have all been kidnapped. Gomez needs to save them. Yep, that works, gives us a reason to play. I've heard people compare this to Mario, Others say it's more like a kind of Metroidvania style, and as you can probably guess, it's somewhere in between. Gomez controls a lot like Mario. His main form of offense is to jump on his enemies, and you can pick up items that give you a weapon or another ability, but will also allow you to take an extra hit, kind of like Mario's costumes or mushrooms. <laughs> The game is totally open plan and you can freely explore the mansion to your heart's content. Not that you'd necessarily want to, everything is out to kill you. Every animal you can think of, crazy mutant people, inanimate objects, crazy mutant people inside of inanimate objects, and get used to all of them because they're absolutely everywhere. Sometimes the screen is completely invaded with enemies and I have no idea what I'm supposed to do about it. Two hits and you're dead. Although this game is fairly generous with where it will let you carry on from if you do die. Lose all of your lives and get a continue though and you're back to the very beginning. Really frustrating considering just how long some of these areas can take to get through. You can unlock more hearts at least, up to five, which makes a massive difference, and you really do want to find a weapon. The sword will stab straight in front of you, and the golf ball bounces out of your hands. Both are pretty good, but they are few and far between, so you need to be careful with them, because remember, one hit and that weapon is gone, and it'll be a while before you find another. <laughs> It's tough, so get used to dying over and over and over. The platforming can get pretty intense and sometimes the enemies can be overwhelming, but once you get a good flow going, it's a pretty satisfying experience. What usually breaks the flow are the all too common platforms that block you from getting a good jump in. I don't mind precise platforming, but this can get a little bit annoying. Despite some of my gripes though, there's plenty of content to enjoy here, every area offers something unique, and the whole game just looks and plays good. Maybe a little bit frustrating at times, but generally a solid and challenging platformer that I would overall recommend. <laughs> So 
how did this fare on the NES? Well, it is the same concept. Rescue your family by exploring the hellspawn infested mansion. This time, it just screams 8-bit in all its janky glory. It controls okay, you just have to get used to it. Think like Mega Man, there's no momentum built up, so you just stop straight away. Unless you're in the freezer where you'll slide around a bit. Aesthetically, it's spooky NES game 101. Bedsheet ghosts, skulls, bones, spiders, all your childhood Halloween favourites which feels right at home in the Adams Family, so yeah. Plus you get a nice little 8-bit rendition of the theme song to top it all off. It manages to somehow be both hard and easy at the same time. It's a pretty short game, most of the puzzles are simple enough to figure out, Nothing's super cryptic or anything like that. Most of the platforming is fine once you're used to the style of controls, but it is full of cheap traps that are nearly impossible to avoid. If you jump on an enemy, you'll bounce off of them. Except here, where they're over the spikes, so you'll fall right through them. Oh, and you have to go down here to get the key to the mansion. And when you do enter the mansion, chandelier falls on your head. No warning, you just gotta grit your teeth and bear it. Hell, half of the rooms you enter do something similar. One room, the pit, just has a pit that you immediately fall down to your death. It's unavoidable. Pick this door and you die. I thought I was going to be clever and use the umbrella in here, but all it does is prolong the inevitable. In some ways it reminds me more of the TurboGrafx CD game, in that each room has its own little gimmick or puzzle to solve, and many of them are only on one screen. You have the slidey floor in the freezer, the bathroom where, for whatever reason, the switch to turn on the shower is three stories high, the stupid toy room where the platforms will knock you off themselves at random. Yeah, I know it coincides with when the faces frown, but there doesn't seem to be any pattern to it, you just gotta get lucky. A lot of backtracking around, finding the items, use the items to access more areas, save family members, who will help you repeat the cycle. It's like a proto-Metroidvania. I find it more annoying than bad. Frustrating parts outweigh the good parts, which makes this difficult to recommend over its Super Nintendo cousin. Last up for Nintendo is our old handheld friend, the Game Boy. So, once again, same concept, explore the manor, rescue the family. Still playing as Gomez, though he looks a bit off this time. Something wrong with his head. His lower jaw is just enormous for some reason. Remember, this is supposed to be based on Raoul Julia. The resemblance is, well, they both have a face, so I guess there's that. Throwing knives are the primary method of attack, which is actually on brand for Gomez. They're not in infinite supply though, so you will need to find more to refill the meter when it starts to run out. Jumping on enemies will still work, but it only stuns them temporarily, and even then it doesn't work on everything, like the bats for no good reason. I like how the ghosts get launched off screen when you hit them like the knife just keeps going and taking the ghost with it. When Gomez takes a hit, he'll start the traditional flickering invincible sprite deal. The annoying part though is he can't attack while he's like this, so being that in order for you to get hit, there's likely an enemy nearby, it is quite frustrating to not be able to fight back. The mansion is a lot emptier than what we've been used to so far, way less rooms to explore, and far too many long, empty corridors that lead to just nothing other than maybe a few enemies to harass you. Feels a little bit like they're trying to waste your time on purpose as filler, anything to artificially lengthen the game. As you progress and rescue more family members, you'll unlock items and weapons to help you along on your way, and some areas will require certain items to access, and more importantly, some bosses are unkillable without more weapons. Like this bear, when I first encountered him, I had no idea what you were supposed to do. You can throw your entire supply of knives at him. 
but it wasn't enough. Jumping on him has no effect, other than causing yourself harm. You have to have more weapons unlocked in order to beat him. Well, that's fine, but the checkpoint you start at when you die to the bear is the start of the boss battle. There's no way back. If you come here too early, it's effectively game over. You're going to have to start from the beginning again. Once you know the correct route to take, though, it's a fairly short game. A very compact, once again, proto-Metroidvania-style title. Though in this case, maybe that's giving it a little bit too much credit. It's fine. I think that's the best way I can describe it. It's just a completely fine Game Boy title. <laughs> So when it comes to games based on the first Adams Family movie, that's Nintendo out of the way. Now we're onto the home computers, and it made it onto a fair few of them throughout 1992. This here is the Atari ST version. If it looks familiar, that's because it's a relatively faithful port of the Super Nintendo version, but with every element downgraded slightly for the system's limitations. Keep note that this is quite close to the end of the Atari ST's lifespan. It's not a bad effort though. It looks the part reasonably well, most of the music is here just in lower quality, and the overall performance is less smooth. Everything feels a bit choppy, instead of smooth scrolling, the screen nudges along in chunks, which makes for a much more clunky experience, especially if you're moving through the stage quickly. The game works the same though, it just feels different thanks to the performance issues. For example, I would find enemies tougher to avoid, as I kept bumping into them as I tried to jump onto other enemies. Plus, I never found any weapons. The other pickups are there, but nothing that requires a second button to activate, which makes sense given that I don't think the Atari ST utilises two button controllers. Correct me if I'm wrong there, because I'm no Atari ST expert. But now we've checked out the Atari version, it would make the most sense to move on to its direct 16-bit competitor, the Amiga. As expected, it's a port of the same game. What I did not expect is for it to be a downgrade in comparison to the Atari ST version. Most of the time it tends to go the other way around, so I don't quite know what happened here. At first it feels better thanks to the smooth scrolling, no more nudging along. Oh, and the music and sound are generally leagues above what the ST was giving us. Far closer to the Super Nintendo soundtrack in quality. Visually though, it's bland and boring thanks to a complete lack of background graphics. Kinda shocking considering the varied and detailed backgrounds found on the other systems. It feels like they forgot to finish designing the game. We still have no weapons to make use of, I'm guessing for the same reason as the ST, but it becomes particularly frustrating on the Amiga as movement of both Gomez and the enemies is less smooth, meaning it's more difficult to judge any dodging enemies or jumping on them. If I could just take the smooth scrolling and sound quality from this version and plop them into the ST version, well, then I'd have the Super Nintendo version, so just play that. The home computer ports just aren't quite up to scratch this time. Okay, now we're really going to get retro. It's the 8-bit home computer ports. The Commodore 64 is probably the most globally famous of these, so let's start with that one. These systems were part of the patient era of video games. Go make a coffee, grab a snack, fingers crossed, after a few minutes, your game decides to work this time. Naturally, this is going to be a downgrade from our 16-bit experiences. It doesn't even really compare much to the NES or Game Boy versions either. Now, you're going to get a gist of the basic premise at this point. That much hasn't changed. Gomez wandering around looking for his family members, whilst fending off various ghouls and traps. Still open plan, got that Metroidvania light style going on. This time you're looking for colour-coded keys to open their corresponding doors. It's a pixel-perfect, flip-scrolling, single-screen-at-a-time platformer. You have to approach each screen as its own platforming puzzle. 
That's fine in games with smooth, tight controls, but this is more on the stiff and awkward side. Plus, everything that hits you has a massive hitbox, making what looks like a successful attempt result in one of many, many deaths for Gomez. There's a certain brand of random chaos with a hint of level design on display. From the get-go, each screen throws everything it's got at you, and it's all one-hit kills, so I don't have any idea what these hearts are supposed to be for. They seem to drain sometimes if I just stood still which was the last bit of extra stress I needed with screens like this. Even the sound bores deep into your skull and messes with your level of concentration. This is what I hear in my techno nightmares. And the more stuff on screen, the more you lose your patience. This is where all the unwanted 80s sound effects were sent to die. Like really, just do yourself a favour and play this game on mute. To add on to all this, there's a lot of unwilling experimenting to figure out what kills you. Some things are obvious, yeah, but others could easily be part of the background or a platform, but actually some kind of instant kill trap. When you've gone through all this, getting to a dead end with a locked door is just devastating. This is a game that needs a map, but this is before we just had that kind of thing expected to be built into the game, so have fun drawing out the map yourself. I think the big collective problem here though is that I'm playing this in the modern day. It was released in the 90s and it plays like something from the 80s, even more specifically from the 80s home computer scene. So it was already kind of dated when it released and now it's been over 30 years. Anyway, let's have a look at how things went over on the Amstrad. Well, I like the colour. Everything definitely stands out more visually. Other than being nicer to look at though, it's the same game as the Commodore 64. The differences are almost exclusively in the presentation. It doesn't play any better, or any worse for that matter. But for that reason, I don't have a lot to add. Almost everything I said about the Commodore 64 version applies here. As for the ZX Spectrum, we get a very specky experience. I'm never going to complain about load times ever again. This was the reality of playing games from a cassette tape. I found this one the most difficult. The ZX Spectrum's colour limitations mean that most objects are transparent, including Gomez himself, making it difficult to gain much momentum before touching something that kills you by accident. Still effectively the same game though, I'm just spending a lot more time looking at the game over screen this time round. So I won't lie, these home computer versions have been a bit of a rough ride. They aren't exactly the best examples of what these systems are even capable of, and are most certainly victims to the passage of time. Thankfully for myself, it's time for some Sega, and that means back to home consoles, starting with the Mega Drive. Well, here we go again. It's the 16-bit version we saw on the Super Nintendo, Atari ST and Amiga. And despite its flaws, it's a welcome sight. I definitely appreciate just how smooth the gameplay is after some of the other experiences I've just had. And gameplay-wise, it's pretty much identical to the Super Nintendo, which means we finally have weapons again. I'd probably dock a couple of points off of this version by comparison when it comes to the presentation. It still looks really good, but the Super Nintendo's colours suit the game a little bit better. Still a fine version of a fine game. A better option than what the home computers were offering at the very least. If 16-bit Adam's Family is what you want, then it's this or the Super Nintendo. And now we're down to the final two versions of this game I'm going to look at, the 8-bit Sega ports. So the Master System offers what is effectively the same game as the NES. It just looks way better. 
The Sega Master System has always had a more brighter and vibrant colour palette than the NES, but in this case it just looks like a whole generation above the NES. For the most part though, it's still the same layout, same items, gameplay feels pretty much the same, complete with that annoying room that's just a pit of spikes that instantly kills you. I suppose out of the two, I'd recommend this version, so this is one of those occasions where the Sega version is better than what we got on Nintendo. But neither are really worth playing. It's not a must-have experience, but hey, if you absolutely have to, this one is at least a little easier on the eyes. And finally, for the Game Gear, it's a fairly typical offering that you see on Game Gear versions, which is just a zoomed-in version of what you got on the Master System. The inventory screen is simplified, and lives are not displayed on the screen during gameplay. All just efforts made to accommodate the small screen of the portable system. It does make things a little bit more difficult, you can't see things coming at you until they're often too close to dodge, unless you were already expecting it of course, and items can end up hidden off screen that you usually would have been able to see on the NES or Master System. That's about it for the differences though. Thankfully and finally, that's it for the Addams Family, as in the video games based upon the Addams Family movie from the time you get the idea. What's more important is that I do kind of regret the order I went through these in. I tried chronological, thinking I was going to get the same game, just ported to different systems. In reality, I got three games, the 16-bit version, the 8-bit home console version, and the 8-bit home computer version. They were all completely different, and I think I would have just split them that way if I was to do this again, but we're done with that now. It was kind of amusing to see what I'd get each time I loaded up a game, but yeah, a bit of a mess. Having gone through all of that now, I can say that it's the 16-bit home console versions, obviously, that are the only ones I'd say are worth giving a shot. Not necessarily essential playing, but decent enough to try. Now this here is Pugsley's Scavenger Hunt. Released between 1992 and 93, depending on the location, and I'm relieved to say it's only been released on Nintendo systems. So just the three versions to look at this time. Still being developed by Ocean Software and often looked upon as a kind of semi-sequel, maybe a spiritual successor to the previous game. This one however is based on the Addams Family Saturday morning cartoon that ran in the same time period, so it's a bit of a different vibe to the movie. Here's the Super Nintendo version to start us off. It's already a similar idea to the movie game. Instead of looking for family members though, Wednesday has given Pugsley a list of items hidden around the house to just go and find. Not very imaginative, more like an excuse for the game's existence than an actual reason for Pugsley to risk his life. And risk his life he does, because this game does not mess around. From the get-go, there are hazards falling on you, the first door you enter contains Morticia, who says she's busy and just come back later. Okay, it's just your son, no reason to care about him I guess. Here we go down a bit more of a traditional road. Each door in the main hallway is a linear level to play through. You don't really backtrack at all, just unlock a couple of levels later on. No weapons, no items, no abilities. A pure platformer with the jump button doing a lot of the heavy lifting. Visually, it's awesome. A really good representation of the cartoon, colourful, well animated, with a ton of variety across the stages. Naturally, these stages make little to no sense. Everything you can imagine is, once again, on a murderous rampage, and Pugsley is at the top of their list. How the Adams family are supposed to function in such an abode is beyond me, but who cares, it's a video game. If you ignore why and just focus on what, it's pretty cool. Each level is totally unique, with Granny's crystal ball stage really standing out, a fun excuse to bring a totally different setting into the game. Really, it all comes down to the difficulty in this game. 
it almost crosses the line into being unfair. The controls are fine, but they're not quite perfect enough for some of the more precise platforming required. Levels can get quite cluttered with hazards, there's hardly ever a safe place to stand still and think, and some of them are real cheap too. Splitting into multiple enemies, being positioned so you can't jump on them without touching some kind of environmental hazard. Did we really need the sandbags falling at random in the hallway? I mean, come on, this is basically the main hub of the game. Imagine in a Mega Man game, you get killed on the level select screen. Like, come on, this is where I go to take a break. No passwords too, so you're expected to beat the game in just one sitting. You gotta be patient. Learn level layouts, take your time, get used to that game over screen. As with a lot of video games at the time, and other games I've looked at in this video, the difficulty is what gives the game its longevity. Once you know it, it's actually a fairly short experience. If you can battle your way past the frustration phase, you may find it to be a bit of a hidden gem in the Super Nintendo library. That, or you're going to throw your controller out the window and call it a day. I'd say both options are totally valid. Take a step over to the NES port, or... Well, wait. Hang on. Doesn't this look a little bit familiar? This isn't a port of Pugsley's Scavenger Hunt. It's a port of the Adams Family, as in the game based on the movie that I looked at a million versions of five minutes ago. So when they put the Adams Family movie game on the 8-bit systems, they made a whole new game, and then proceeded to actually make a faithful port of it when they needed a Pugsley game on the console. My guess is they just didn't have the time or resources to do a full 8-bit NES port of the Super Nintendo Pugsley game, but they had enough assets from the Adams Family game to work with and just went with it instead. I don't know, that's just my theory. It's not too bad either, probably one of the better versions of this game for the 8-bit consoles. The whole layout is the same, the pickups are there, minus the weapons, and the money has become candy, but functions the same way. Some whole areas have been cut, I assume, to save space. Maybe that's why they originally didn't port the Adams Family game over. Instead, you just skip straight through to some of the bosses. There's also no music outside of the title screen, which is a little disappointing because the Adams Family game actually had a decent soundtrack. They did change the main hall of the mansion. For Pugsley, it has this winding staircase that I swear is impossible to walk up. I don't know what they were trying to do here, but I have to jump up every time. It's really awkward. Perhaps what really stood out the most is how creepy Pugsley looks. With his unorthodox movement animations and large, dark, empty eye sockets. When he dies, you're presented with one of the most genuinely terrifying faces to grace an NES title. And the Game Boy version is... Yeah, you guessed it, it's the same old game once again. Of all the bazillion ports of this game, this is definitely the most stripped down, with even more areas cut and zoomed in visually to fit the small Game Boy screen easier. The music is non-existent outside of the title screen once again, meaning your ears are going to get very familiar with the jumping sound effect. It gives the game a kind of sad and lonely feeling atmosphere. It's interesting how the most impactful soundtrack for this game so far is having no soundtrack at all. I did feel like I had an easier time with this version, but honestly at this point that might be down to me having so much practice at this game now. Even zoomed in I know what to expect ahead of me half of the time. For the Game Boy, it's nothing special, but I suppose hardly the worst option. You know, it is a shame that we didn't get to see more interpretations of the original Super Nintendo version of Pugsley's Scavenger Hunt. I'd have liked to have seen how they'd have translated it onto the 8-bit consoles, but it just wasn't meant to be. One thing I can say though is I'm definitely done with this game now, what I once called the Adams Family, but it's now just a collection of Adams Family related games. Whatever, that's done. New year, new movie, new games. 
Adam's Family Values made its way into theatres in December 1993. So naturally we get the game a year and a half later. And just on the 16-bit consoles now, with the Mega Drive version being exclusive to Europe and commanding a fairly high price, just in case you're interested in that sort of thing. We're still with Ocean, so there's a reasonable expectation of a passable quality game. Now, it may have only been a couple of short years, but at this point, you know what's taken its place in gaming history? A Link to the Past. So you know what we get? Not quite a Link to the Past. But a valiant effort in the top-down action-adventure genre, nonetheless. We're now back to finding ourselves controlling Fester, who appears to be the top-down view favourite. I don't know, maybe it's his head that stands out. And we are playing him in his quest to save Pubert from Debbie. Not the exact plot from the movie, but close enough, closest we've come so far to actually matching the source material. Everything you'd expect from the genre is here. Dungeons puzzles, an inventory full of items that serve various purposes, usually to help you progress to new areas, some NPCs to interact with, such as the Adams family themselves, but also various beings that you'll encounter that present you with missions, or sometimes even act as a shop. The whole game is really good at building the atmosphere. Environments are detailed and varied, and the soundtrack stands out as especially good. Some of the best atmospheric and scene setting music and sound effects I've heard in a 16-bit game, and that's saying something. Honestly I'd say sometimes it's almost too creepy for the Adams family. What's a shame is despite all of this, the exploration is a bit of a chore. Everything is a maze, whether it's the overworld hiding basic required paths, or the dungeons becoming complicated labyrinths of doors and teleporting tiles that tie your brain in knots. If you talk to Gomez at the start of the game, he will give you a map, but it's quite useless. I feel like I'm trying to decipher some ancient unknown language. It hardly really explains where you are at all. But when you do figure out where to go, Fester is primarily equipped with his Sith-style lightning attack, and then one extra additional item you can equip as well, very Zelda-style. The lightning attack is okay, but it's always to Fester's right-hand side, and the range decreases as you take damage. So when you're down to one skull of health, it's practically a close-range melee attack, and all it takes is one enemy to be stuck to Fester's left, to rinse your health down. And yeah, come on, this is the Adams Family, skulls represent health, no hearts here. You can get some extra weapons, but they're all limited ammo, so it's one of those occasions where you end up saving them, hoping for the perfect moment, and inevitably never actually using them. It can get quite tough, especially as you start to get lost and backtrack, intentionally or not, which results in getting impatient and trying to skip as many enemies as possible, only increasing the chances of taking a hit. It's a one life then game over situation, though there is a basic continue system that doesn't always start you in a good place, and a needlessly obtuse password system, where you have to find Cousin It, who's hiding somewhere in each area, who will then proceed to actually tell you the password. Considering some of the basic paths and doors in each area can be a royal pain to find sometimes, finding something that's actually supposed to be hidden away, well, you're more likely to just find him by mistake. The passwords are, of course, needlessly epic in length as well. It feels like I'm writing out a whole novel. It's certainly no Zelda, but... It's still something I'd recommend if you're looking for a similar experience. As long as you have a guide within arm's reach to reference when it starts to get on the frustrating side of things, it's not a bad effort for this style. I don't have a huge amount to add when we're talking about the Sega Mega Drive version. It's the same game, with a few little differences being in the presentation. The music has that typical Mega Drive bassiness, if that's a word. And while I usually prefer a lot of Sega's music, this time I think the Super Nintendo just works a little bit better. Still good though, don't get me wrong.
visually we get less effects in place on the Mega Drive. So no weather effects where you would see some in the Super Nintendo version. Outside of that though, there's very little difference on the graphical level and the gameplay and layout totally identical. As I mentioned before, this is a Europe and I think Australia only release when it comes to the Sega version. Not only is it slightly inferior to the Super Nintendo, the Super Nintendo version is also easier to get your hands on. Needless to say, we didn't get any video games based on the 1998 straight-to-video movie The Addams Family Reunion, which is likely for the best. Though that same year, we did get the release of the Canadian television series The New Addams Family. It only lasted for one single season and somehow did manage to get one video game based on it. Well, I suppose it's technically two if you count an arcade shock machine, but we're just going to go with the one video game. This was developed by Seventh Sense, a very small scale Italian developer that don't have much of note to their name. Release was scheduled for 2001 in the US, but got cancelled, with Microids publishing the game in Europe in 2002, a fair few years after the TV show ended, and released under the title The New Addams Family Series. Not sure why they needed to add the word series on the end, it just sounds unnatural and cumbersome to say out loud. And what's up with this music? Not the best start. No Adams Family theme song in a piece of Adams Family media is just criminal. Even worse though is it keeps teasing you with little elements of the Adams Family theme, only to then go back on itself and do its own thing. It's effectively a point and click adventure, which is definitely a bit of a shocker. I hardly associate the Game Boy Color with the adventure genre, that's usually more at home on a PC at that point in time. But honestly though, I'm surprised of how well it functions for the handheld system. You move around with the D-pad, objects and people are highlighted and you press either A or B to examine or interact with them. The start menu will show you your inventory and from there you can use objects on other objects that you can currently own or with objects in the outside world. As for the point of it all, well the Adams Family Mansion is under threat from a theme park builder who claims to own the deeds to the property. So now for whatever reason it's up to Wednesday and Pugsley to figure it out whilst all of the adults stand around thinking as if that's going to help. Oh and so much for it being based on the new Adams Family TV show, it looks nothing like it. <laughs> I'd say it's okay, it doesn't really require much lateral thinking or problem solving skills to get through, it's more like a bunch of fetch quests than puzzles. It tells you exactly what to do and where to go, a little too often for it to be any real challenge. It reminds me a little bit of old adventure style flash based browser games from way back in the day, the sort of thing you'd find on like the Cartoon Network website or something. Pretty simple, but it's just enough to keep you playing. After the new Adams Family, the franchise went into a state of sort of hibernation. They kept trying all these attempts to ride the highs of the original 90s movie, it just didn't really take off. It's just not that easy to replicate such a strong cast. What we did get is in 2009, a stage musical, but I'm not really the right person to ask about that. It's popular with audiences, not so much with critics. Make of that what you will if you're a musical fan. It took two decades for the Adams Family to finally return to screens with the, in my opinion, fairly mediocre 2019 animated movie. So what better game to have alongside it than a fairly mediocre 2019 App Store game. Here we are, the modern era. The Adams Family Mystery Mansion pops onto iOS and Android the same year as the 2019 film. Morticia and Gomez have been away on some terrible vacation, and now they need to completely refurbish the mansion. Every franchise imaginable has been given this style of mobile game, 
and this one is no different. I don't know if this genre has a name, but I will just call it build to unlock to build to unlock to build to unlock. You get the idea. It's just that on an endless loop of gathering not quite enough of the multiple currencies. But hey, you can always watch some ads or buy some more for real world currency. There's plenty of dull dialogue to skip through. The family members each have their own specific quests, which is just this game's way of telling you to go buy some more currency in order to buy some objects to fulfil the family's requests. That or it'll just take days of waiting for loading bars to fill out and watching ads. If you couldn't tell, I don't really care much for these mobile games designed to eat your wallet with minimal to no gameplay to really speak of. I would recommend it if you enjoy microtransactions. Otherwise, you'll enjoy your life a lot more, just completely ignoring that this exists. I'd rather just move on to the other game we got based off the 2019 animated movie and its 2021 sequel, The Addams Family Mansion Mayhem. I say it's based off the movies, but story-wise it's just its own thing. It's just rehashing the old some guys after the mansion narrative we've seen a lot before. The whole story plays out in text boxes with no voice acting to speak of. We just get in-character grunts whenever someone starts talking. <laughs> ah. It gets kind of annoying the hundredth time you've heard it, and it feels cheap, which I guess isn't surprising considering this is a budget title, but it still would have made a massive difference to the whole experience of this game to just have these scenes play out in very basic in-game cutscenes. It doesn't need to be some crazy pre-rendered artistic feat, just give us a little something to make us care. Instead, I just skip through all of it because it doesn't feel particularly important. The actual gameplay is that of a multiplayer, fixed camera, 3D platformer. Super simple, but not exactly the most common sight for a 2021 game, especially for a licensed title. It supports up to four players, with each selecting a family member to play as. The loading screens give the impression that each character has its own unique ability, and maybe that was originally intended in the development of the game or something, but that's simply not true. They all play exactly the same, and they unlock and access new abilities at the same point of the game as everyone else. Anyway, once you get into it, what we really have here is an entry-level collectathon. Family crests are the collectible in question, with three available to be acquired per level when you meet certain criteria or complete certain objectives. One of these is always to collect a certain number of doubloons, and then the other two often involve you exploring off the beaten path to fulfil some small task before getting back to the linear route towards the end of the stage. No matter what, you'll almost always end up with at least one family crest, just because of how generous the game is with the doubloons. It's almost unmissable. Future stages will need you to have a specific number of crests to unlock them, though the game is pretty forgiving here and it's unlikely you'll find yourself having to return to an earlier stage unless you're a completionist. Occasionally the gameplay gets broken up by a mini-game requiring a certain high score to progress. These do help a little bit, as the main levels can drag. There's some creative enough ideas in place here, even if a little bit basic, that overstay their welcome. You'll encounter a level with a fun little gimmick that will then proceed to take 15 to 20 minutes to beat, by which time you'll start to get a little bit sick of it. The whole time it's going to feel sort of almost nostalgically familiar, but that's because you've probably played countless of other platformers with the same idea, but better in execution. This game would have been outdated if it was released 10 years earlier, let alone 2021. It has real PS2 generation bargain bin vibes. It's not bad at all actually, it just plays very very safe making it a very good option, I'd say, as an introductory game for younger children, especially if you wanted to get involved as well as a parent or sibling via co-op. So yeah, maybe it's nothing special, but there is a place for games like this in the modern world. I just wish it had a little bit more to do with the Adams family. There's nothing especially spooky or kooky at play here. The lack of the true cutscenes kind of nullifies the character showing any personality, and this is another one where I didn't hear the theme song at all. 
remove the characters looking like the Adams Family characters, and you would quite literally have no way of knowing this is supposed to be an Adams Family game. So yeah, not a disaster to finish us off with, but nothing really all that special either. I could use the same sentence to describe the entire Adams Family gaming history to be honest. There's no masterpieces, but there's plenty of nice little functioning video games in there. And that's it for all of the officially licensed Adams Family video games. But I do feel it is worth mentioning the pinball machine. It is the best selling pinball machine of all time and despite being over 30 years old at this point, if you really want to go and play it, you're probably able to find a functioning machine out there. Just look at some online maps, there's like pinball maps out there, and you'll find these relatively easily. More importantly though, it's worth mentioning because there are some video game adaptions. The first of which I believe came out on Pinball Arcade back in 2015. It came out with the help of Kickstarter and didn't last all that long. It was delisted from stores around three years later due to licensing issues. In 2023, we have a version on Pinball FX. Now, this one is what you're seeing the footage of right now because I'm actually able to purchase and play this in the modern day, the year 2024 that we're sitting in. There is a version for visual pinball. This is a kind of digital pinball emulation software that is a little bit beyond me. It's supposed to be complicated to set up, but as close as you're going to get to a real pinball experience through a digital channel. I can't really give much of a review. For me, the Pinball FX version is perfectly good and fine. I'm a pinball fan, but not a big pinball enthusiast, if you get what I mean. So I'm not going to be able to tell you what you really need to know if you're into pinball, but the options are out there. And that is actually it this time. No more games to look at. I'm not sure when we'd ever see another Adams Family video game. Licensed video games just don't come out all that much these days. We would have a million video games based on Wednesday by now thanks to the huge popularity that show has had, but that's just not really the way things work anymore. 